So a couple weeks ago, Marie was doing a children's message, and it started a bit scarily for me. She started by asking the children, raise your hand if you like Pastor Stephen. And I thought, well, this, this could be dangerous. I got out my notepad so I could write down names here. But then she continued, well, how many like Pastor Marie best? I'm like, well, this seems like a dangerous contrast. But then it's, well, how many like Mr. Dan? How many like Mr. Steve? Miss you all these different people. And her point was that often we create divisions and we pick our favorites. So the good news she shared was that we can go beyond tribalism. Here's my group and here's your group. I want to continue that theme today with Paul as he kind of continues that from chapter 1 into chapter 3. I love this ending of chapter 3. Paul says, So let no one boast about human leaders, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all belong to you. And you belong to Christ, and Christ belongs to God. <clears throat> now, chapter 3 starts with the Apostle Paul writing to his friends in Corinth and telling them there being a bunch of real knuckleheads. My word, not his. Mere infants is how he puts it. He tells them that he gave them milk because they weren't ready for solid food yet. They're too immature. Paul loves to throw a little shade in Scripture. It's kind of his, like, go-to. It's like, you know, everyone's sort of throwing shade at the people he's talking about. But why does he write this? Why does he think this? Well, it's because they've been arguing about their favorites, and it's become an issue of division. Now, I know it's hard to believe that there'd be divisions and arguments in the church, but it happened, and it happens. You know, Marie preached those issues just a few weeks ago. We create these divisions so easily. A bit of background. Paul and his friends have been traveling around telling people about Jesus, stopping in cities like Corinth. Now, over time, the people in Corinth began to have favorites, some preferring Paul's teaching, some preferring Apollo's teaching, and some liking Cephas's teaching more. Cephas is another name for Peter. Now, their fondness of their particular favorite teacher had become so intense that there was quarreling and jealousy among them. Now, this makes Paul mental. I love how he puts it. For when one of you says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere human beings? The obvious answer is, well, yeah, of course we're just human beings. But he's getting after something bigger here. He's calling them to transcend the usual petty ways we divide ourselves. Now, back then, 2,000 years ago, people tended to make celebrities out of their leaders, developing allegiances to one and arguing for why the one is better than the other. It's way different than we are today. <laughs> so far, fairly straightforward. These folks in Corinth have taken something good, these teachers coming to their city to help them better understand the way of Jesus, and they've turned it into a source of division and quarreling and jealousy. But he's just getting started. He then asks, what after all is Apollos? What is Paul? His answer, only servants. And then he adds, I planted the seed. Apollos watered it. But God has been making it grow. There's a lot going on here, but at the most basic level, Paul's calling them out of their division and quarreling by showing them how God uses lots of different people to do lots of different things, all to help us grow and mature in faith. I often hear when people join the church, they come, they say maybe what brought them to the church. Sometimes it's the music program. Sometimes it's the teaching. Sometimes it's the fellowship. Now, do you think it'd be ridiculous if somebody came for the music and then as soon as the anthem was over, they left and they covered their ears during the sermon and they never, I, I get that sometimes, <laughs> they never wanted to participate in the fellowship. They never did the mission. What's the point of the church? Or I only come for the sermon. I'm going to close my ears during the music. I don't actually want to connect to anyone. 
I want to do education, but I don't want to participate in mission. Each is different. The worship, the education, the mission, the fellowship, the music, all has a different way of, of helping us understand who God is, to connect to God. Now, you may find one connects better for you, that you might be more drawn to music or teaching or mission or fellowship, but they're all good. And we don't say, well, because I like fellowship best, we shouldn't have music. We shouldn't have education. We shouldn't have this. But that's what's happening here. Well, I like Apollos, so we have no need for Paul. We have no need for Peter. It's like music. We all have favorite kinds of music we like, especially church music. But it'd be like saying, you know what? Let's only do Baroque music because no other kind is good. Let's only do Romantic music. Let's only do Gregorian chant. Let's only do shape note singing. One of the beautiful things about this church is we can have the whole gamut of music. At the 8 o'clock service, we had a Vivaldi piece, and then we had a modern Mark Miller anthem. We had a hymn that had more of that Jewish kind of tune to it. Then you had the classic, all creatures of our God and King. Each brings something to the table. But what's happening is Corinth, they're saying, I don't want this, that, and the other thing. Here's my favorite. It's all I want. And it drives Paul crazy because you're rejecting the good and the beautiful and the true. He then launches into a long bit about the grace that God has given Paul and the foundation that is in Christ and how they are God's temple. Now, by the way, when someone talks about their body being a temple, have you ever heard that? My body is a temple. The yous in the New Testament are almost always plural. It should really be translated y'all, which is the correct way to talk, as Marie alluded to last week. <laughs> Paul was writing to a group of people, a body of believers. It's not that you or I, the individual, is the temple, but us together. That's when we're the temple. So when he says, you are a temple of God, he's telling a group of people, they are the temple. We together are the house of God. When two or three gather, Jesus is there. Now this would have been an extraordinarily new and powerful idea at the time when the temples of gods and goddesses were these giant, shiny, magnificent, marvel wonders of the world. In the midst of that, Paul tells this frumpy, divisive, flawed group of Jesus followers that they are a temple. Not that shiny marble building on the hilltop that only a few people can get into. They are where God is found. And that's good news of great joy. And just when you're deep into a bit about foolish and wise of the world, Paul drops this hammer. He says, so then, no more boasting about human leaders. Well, I'm glad we got that message. We did not. And you realize that all of this has been a brilliant exposition of the problem he started with, which was petty quarreling over who was whose favorite teacher. But all the while, he's actually been ramping up to deliver this epic crescendo, which begins with, all things are yours. And you can stop that right there. It's so good. All things are yours are yours. He then adds whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas. He's showing them how God uses lots of different people to teach them and instead of choosing a favorite and then not listening to the others who aren't their favorite, he tells them to claim it all, whoever it comes from. All the teachers are theirs. They should enjoy the good and the true wherever it comes from. It's all a gift from God to help us grow. Imagine that maybe, just maybe, we could learn something and prosper more as a people and a nation if we listen to both Schumer and McConnell, Pelosi and McCarthy, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Clarence Thomas, instead of he's all right, she's all wrong, my teacher, my candidate, my pastor is better than yours, I'm only going to listen to them because they must be completely all wrong. And we wonder why we go down one-lane roads and crash. Why would you cut yourself off from more truth? 
It's a true sign of hubris and delusion if we think our side, our candidate, our favorite, our way of looking at the world has all the right answers and the other side, team, leader, philosophy has all the wrong ones. Paul says don't limit yourself to one teacher, one leader, one judge, one interpretation, one style, because God is always bigger than our one. But then Paul keeps going. He's not done. Because after the whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas part, he adds the world. The world is yours. So the sentence reads, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world. You see what he's doing here. He starts with their petty jealousies and rivalries and partisan politics, and he grabs them by the shoulder and essentially says, you're missing it. All of these teachers are gifts from God to help you grow, so don't cut yourself off from what they can potentially give you by picking favorites and only listening to the one who you follow because you're missing out. You're not receiving all God has for you. Claim it all. It's all yours. Whatever good that comes your way, whatever truth they may help you understand, you've got to see things from that higher perspective. And then while he's at it, he expands things to include the whole world. The world is yours. In other words, everything that is good and beautiful and true. But what does he mean by that? Wherever you find truth, not just through teachers like him and Peter and Apollos, but whatever helps you grow, however your mind and heart are open to what God is doing in the world, whatever ways or people or events God uses you to teach your truth, affirm it, claim it, own it, it's all yours. But he's not done. He then adds, or life or death. And then, or the present, or the future, he starts with teachers and expands to the world, and then he expands it to include being alive or dead. Then he expands it to include everything that is and everything that will be, but he's not done because all are yours, and you are in Christ, and Christ is of God. And that ends chapter 3. Now, my hope is at this point you have a sense of something profound happening here. Some good news that can be completely life-changing. But can we believe it? And more so, can we live into it? You know, sometimes I notice people belittle the Bible as lacking in depth or sophistication. I think they reveal the profound ignorance because it doesn't matter how smart or educated or studied someone is to make broad dismissals of scriptures having nothing to say to the modern world about what it means to be human is absurd and naive because this passage here in 1 Corinthians is a layered, eloquent, highly articulate and wise exploration of how we know and how we think and how we interact with this world. I notice, too, that sometimes people use this phrase, God's truth. Have you heard that phrase? I just subscribe to God's truth. It's a bit problematic, because what other kind of truth is there? If it's true, then it's from God. Science, art, politics, history, psychology, biology, all truth is God's truth. To say something is God's truth implies that some truth belongs to God, and then there's another kind of truth that apparently doesn't belong to God. If it's true, it has only one source, God. So whenever you stumble upon truth, wherever you stumble upon truth, whoever says it, however you come across it, you affirm it and you claim it because it's yours and it's from God. It's a gift whether from Republicans or Democrats, Christians or Muslims, rural or city, millennial or boomer, give thanks for truth when you find it. This takes us back to Corinth. Paul hears that his friends in Corinth are picking sides, arguing with each other about whose teacher is better, refusing to engage with teachers other than their favorite. 
He uses this situation to teach them about engaging with the truth wherever they find it, not just through these different teachers, but anywhere in the world. This is why when people debate faith versus science, they've already missed the point by beginning the debate. Faith is about embracing truth wherever it's found, and that, of course, includes science. <coughs> Paul is trying to set them free. He wants them to become the kind of people that can embrace whatever is true and good and noble wherever they find it. But this freedom works both ways. We're free to affirm wherever we find truth, but we're also free to deny that which needs to be denied. If it's wrong or unjust or twisted, we call it whatever it is. This includes religious things, pastors, and of course, things that go on in churches under the name of Jesus. The church and its leaders have not always been right. Just because a church says it, a pastor says it, I say it, doesn't mean it's truth. Test it against the person and work of Jesus Christ, who God has revealed God's self to be. Don't elevate anyone, any group, any organization, or anything else in the world as an infallible source of truth. It will let you down. Even the church, we don't always get it right. Here's another fact of life, though. Some people are messed up and they make no sense. They don't help you grow. They spread all kinds of hate and they're toxic. We've all had people in our lives that every time we're with them, we just feel worse about ourselves. They steer us astray. They try to make us believe things that aren't true about them, even about us. They try to mislead you and manipulate you. Don't listen to them. You don't have to. You can find truth anywhere, but you can find falsehood anywhere as well. Some things that are labeled Christian aren't true. And some things that aren't labeled Christian are true. Some atheists are compassionate and kind and say lots of things that are true. And some Christians are completely closed-minded and hateful. Some Muslims or Hindus speak truth and love, and some Christians speak falsehood and hate. Truth can be found almost anywhere and in anyone, but Paul grounds the whole thing in Christ. Paul wants his readers to see that Christ is bigger than any one teacher, any one set of ideas, the world or life or death or present or future or anything else you can think of. He wants his friends in Corinth to enjoy the truth wherever they find it, to celebrate it and receive it as the good gift it is from the source of all things, God. So why does this matter in 2020? I think because religion and society have given people a lot of categories and labels that simply aren't helpful. And we think we have to stay in our own lanes with our own groups, parties, clubs, people. We create these little divisions and say, well, I'm Presbyterian. I can't go over to the Episcopal Church. I can't do anything that seems too Catholic. Well, I'm Republican. I can't possibly agree with a Democratic person. Well, I'm Democrat. I can't possibly think this Republican idea is good. Well, I like old traditional music. I can't possibly enjoy anything that was written after 1990. That's silly. But we do it all the time. But here's the reality. Your experience of Christ will consistently transcend whatever boxes you've created. I think some of those who've been studying Islam with Marie in the issues class and visited some of the local mosques have found that to be true as you've gone outside the categories you've always put yourself in, the stereotypes you've always heard. And you have to kind of rethink and say, well, maybe this is true too. Maybe this can be helpful to me. Maybe they aren't who I thought they were. Maybe I'm not who I thought I was. Where can you find truth? Where can you find love and goodness? Paul invites us to be open to beauty and truth wherever we find it, because that's where God gives it. We must affirm what should be affirmed, deny what shall be denied, all while being rooted and grounded in Christ who keeps insisting that all things are ours. All things, all teachers, all truth, all in the world, all in life and in death, all things, all these good things are ours in Christ. And that's good news of great joy, if we're willing to believe it 
and live it? Are you willing to step outside your boundaries and appreciate truth and goodness and beauty and things that can help you grow? Or do we just eat ice cream for every meal? We get sick after a while. And that's where we find ourselves as a world. We've all been eating one thing and wondering why things aren't going right. We have to branch out and appreciate the truth wherever we find it. And this from a guy 2,000 years ago writing, and we still haven't figured it out. May God give us the grace and wisdom to start now. Let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank that you are the source of all life, all truth, all goodness. Help us to receive that wherever we find it, wherever we give it. Lord, thank you that all things are ours in you, in you. All truth, all teachers, all in the world, all in life and in death, present and the future. Thank you, God, for being the God of all things and the God of all people. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.